I'm going to begin. Uh, first, I loved the movie, guys. I thought it was just absolutely wonderful. I found it really moving and just really tender. But Matt, Matt I was going to ask you uh, first, what, what made you think that this would be the, the perfect idea for your next project? And just how pleased were you when, uh, when Saranoff agreed? Uh, I'm very, very pleased. Like, um, yeah, thanks for that. I think, um, obviously, really pleased and then just hoping that I could sort of get the level of trust and and ultimately sort of friendship, I guess, that meant that I could tell the story and get to know him in the way I've got to know him and hopefully have shared that through the film. That was kind of one of the key things. I think it was always, um, the idea is, was in the sort of contradictions that I could see in the, this idea of what he was, the explorer, and also challenging some of the assumptions about what people think, you know, so the frosty eyelashes, the chiseled jaw, that sort of image that people have in their minds actually is is a truth. There is a truth to that as well as a myth, but also there's this other side to Rand, this not the explorer, the everyday person, the sort of gentleness, the, the friendships, the, the love, the loss, all those things that I wanted to get to, to make this film not just about expeditions, but about, you know, about life and about things we can all relate to. So that was it. So it, to me, it was all it has to be, I've always said it, but it's always this idea of it being a portrait, not an autobiography. I didn't want to just go through a list of events that happened. I wanted to sort of get a sense of the personality and who and what makes him tick. Because yeah. yeah, just as a doc, I'm just interested as a documentarian, how much prep can you allow yourself to do before getting the green light from the subject? Or does that have to be the very first thing that happened? Um, I think I you, you got, I think you got a, the green light is always such a technical term. But I know you're right. I know what you mean. It's but it's like. There was no green light as such from a broadcaster, but it was, I needed a green light from Ran. I needed to know that he liked me and wanted to do it and that he trusted me. And then we went through the process as always of you do a bit of filming. And I realized on the first day of filming with him, which is that scene in the car park was the first thing I filmed, you know, and that whole day was extraordinary. We went from the car to the festival hall and Bear Grylls and he's a hero to Bear, big book deal, eating chocolate cake, you know, all these different sides to the personality were sort of on show. So that was filmed before there was a green light, if you like. Mm. But what I had the green light, I hope from Ran at that point, he knew what I was doing and we talked about it. Enough. Yeah, but no green light from my wife about chocolate cake. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and Ran, I was going to ask, I mean, uh, when, you know, as, as Matt just mentioned, it is a real portrait of your life. How is it for you to watch this film back? Is it quite a, an emotional experience? Is it quite a profound one? Do you actually find it quite difficult to sit through, to sit through this movie? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it went back 60 years sort of thing. So it, it's amazing to relive memories because film exists, which you couldn't even remember. It was still around to, to look at sort of thing. And it had been sitting in our office in tins, 16 millimeter tins. And after, I think, 30 years of looking at them each time you pass the office door and realizing that when you die, they're going to be thrown away sort of thing. I heard there was a thing called the British Film Institute and that they would stack them. And they, they even had the Titanic disaster on movie footage. So we got onto them and they took everything away which is great and stored it unlike where it had been at the correct temperature. And uh, yeah, that's where it remained, but they were an archivist unit. Their job was to store an archive and file, not to get commercial sort of involvement, but that switched not all that long ago. And they started to make available a reasonable term, in, you know, that it could be shown in public sort of thing. And that is how it started. Mm. Mm. And Rand, do you actually think that you can learn more about yourself from watching someone else like, dissect your own life? I suppose that is absolutely true, but you're just thinking about the actual event mm. in the past that you're seeing looking at again. Uh, like, you know, Ginny when she was sort of 12 or younger, um, because that was about the age she was nine when I first uh, met her. That sort of thing is such a long time ago. It's amazing watching it all over again. A hula hoop thing around her neck. We, we just remember the hula hoop. Yes, yeah. it's so great when she's got the hula hoop, and we were so lucky to get to get that stuff. But no, the, that archive was was a gift. But again, always being, I always felt like it could be driven by the fly on the wall stuff, the observational stuff. Just being that helps me sort of navigate all of the masses of it. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, because my, I mean, I found it a very, I, I, like as I said before, I found it a really moving film. I think so full of humanity. How was it for you when you're piecing this all together through, you know, current day sort of footage and, and interviews with the kind of archive footage? Did you, can you get emotionally caught up or is there a distance when you're in the process of crafting it? Yeah, I mean, you get, you, you do get caught up in it emotionally for sure. But I think, as you know, if you're making films yourself, you know, you get, you need a bit of distance because you end up watching it over and over again. And so, it does become that does become an exercise of you know, you've always got to remember the emotional response absolutely like if you lose that and you've lost everything so trying to keep it fresh or let charlie the editor and ben the editor let them work on an idea and sit back from it so that i could have a natural response to it that would be the the sort of process but i think also having it all laid out you know like you would have a classic sort of whiteboard with pen in the edit suite you know we've got all of our sort of personality traits that i've feel like I've learned about him through conversations and we know we want to reveal those but not just state them in a boring sort of say and see sort of way but actually feel them and understand them not by me doing it with voiceover or anything like that but actually just seeing it come through the archive or the present day or a letter or a school report or an autobiography from his mum you know using those layers and textures was really important to me yeah. I mean, this is a documentary about, I mean, about you, Ryan, as, as a man who's pushed himself to succeed like few others kind of ever have. And I think what I sort of loved about this was trying to understand and what, what drives you. I was wondering if you, are you able to articulate what it is that drives, that keeps you going? Was it something that just kind of happens and you're unable to kind of put your actual finger on, on, on what it is that, that keeps pushing you to go further than so few men ever have? Well, as the years go by, your motivation for doing it and doing it again and again, if you can succeed the first time, um, it's changing. There were different things. And initially, um, we just wanted to make a living, uh, Jenny and me, okay? Then that moves on to realizing that um, it's going to cost money to do a thing like that sort of thing. And how can we evolve a way of doing it where it doesn't cost money? And Jenny came up in the early days with the idea that if you're starting an electrician company or a plumbing company, you get one good electrician, and from there you build a company up. But she said, no, that's too slow. What we need to do is to take advantage of the fact that there are only four TV channels that can be watched in the UK, BBC One and Two, ITV One and Two, and that the World About Us series was watched by a huge number of people in the UK. And they usually showed expedition films. And I happened to have got onto a thing called Expedition Under London, not Barbara Windsor, but uh, Liz Fraser, who was the other blonde in the carry on things. And uh, I got chosen for that. And then the, what's his name? The uh, Cubby Broccoli bloke was looking for a new bond because the other one was uh, George Lazenby who was costing too much <laughs> to carry on. So they were looking for someone, they had 200 people they wanted to look at. And I was lucky enough to be one of them. Uh, and I got into the last six. So I began to think, good God, this might actually get somewhere. And uh, Roger Moore came along and <laughs> he definitely got that. And, but it introduced to us the fact that we could get onto movies by doing expeditions, which were really big news, like the first this or the first that. And so Ginny planned the first journey up the longest river in the world the year we got married. That's the Nile, 4,000 miles long. And we eventually, she discovered that there was a hovercraft, a two-seater hovercraft prototype, um, and that that was in the Guinness Book of Records for having hovered without a breakdown for two hours around a gravel pit in Peterborough, <laughs> and therefore obviously the right model for the Nile. And uh, yeah, it, it had a two-inch clearance. We took eight and a half months to do the Nile, partly because there were a lot of three-inch obstacles en route and but it got peak viewing so immediately the number of people who wanted to sponsor us was right up there so we got boom boom quite quick thanks to Jenny's planning and over the next 36 years we did 30 expeditions and all of them going for records to begin with hot countries but then the UK media started only wanting cold polar ones and uh, so we switched, but there are only two poles. So there aren't all that many records to break. And what there was had almost all been broken by the enemy, the Norwegians. And uh, so we had to uh, realize that. And that became rivalry. 
And that was one of our first motivations to carry on doing it. Then there was another one, which is when scientists got interested in joining our expeditions. And then there was another one raising money. We're up to about 19 million at the moment for charities who were chosen by the sponsors. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, that also, you sort of see in that that there's this incredible sort of hustle and sort of response and sent, you know, a, a changing way, I guess, of exploring perhaps. I mean, I haven't been around to chart it, obviously, but I sort of feel like from what I've seen, there was the era of, you know, the great Shackleton and Scott, and then there was the, the now, the today, which is different in its own way. And Ran and Ginny were at this age where, you know, PR was there and they needed to do things and they needed to sort of figure out how to get the scientists involved and how to get the sponsorship. And it was a really interesting period, I think, in exploring. And I sort of, I want the film to, I guess, a little bit to challenge that idea of what it means to be an explorer, because I think that's, that's changing, or it always is, you know. Yeah, because yeah, Ran, I mean, you are sort of right, widely known and as and considered to be the kind of greatest living explorer. Is that something you ever think about? Do you ever stop and think, actually, I, I probably am? <laughs> no, I don't find myself starting to think about that sort of thing, because I like to paint a black picture to people who are wanting to join the expedition. And so that black picture is in my mind, and it's sort of my reaction to getting overexcited because you know somebody's chosen you to do this or the other and i didn't call myself the world's greatest living explorer that would come from the um what's his name who introduced it uh david frost da david guinness frost book, yeah. yeah and the guinness book of records so no and i look at the people who i want to be selected and choose them on very amazing grounds like the word nice if they're nice people but on top of that, you've got to have their motivations got to be strong enough to deal with the horrible, weak voice which comes into their heads during an expedition when they're starting to get frostbite and gangrene and crutch rot. And once they start uh, having that saying, I can't keep going, that's not good motivation. So we choose them on their motivational strength. I also think it's that, that word inspiration which gets thrown around a lot, but that's what you get, I think, from it. And I don't mean that just in what he did in the expeditions. I mean, just also like just sleeping in your car because you have to, or, you know, making ends meet because you've got no money to do the next thing. It's like that, that, that greatness is somewhere in between, you know, doing the mountains, but also just being on the road and lecturing and being busy every day and having a, you know, a day job effectively, which is to sort of do the talks and all that. It's kind of, and I think that's what's, what can be looked back on and carried back, but also carried forward is that idea of, if you could bottle him up <laughs> and, and sort of contain him, then he'd be, you know, everyone should you, needs a bit of that, I think. So my, my final question, I was just wondering, and it's for both of you, but I, I, obviously in Randolph, you would have seen a few more corners of, <laughs> of the earth than most people, but of all the places both of you have ever been to in your life, where is there one you both have a yearning to go back to? Oh, that's over to me, is it? Um, I would say that we do hot expeditions, we do cold polar expeditions, and more recently, we've done vertical uh, expeditions as well into the mountain field, not the polar field, which is nearly all flat. And things have changed. And in the 70s, we were using the same navigational processes as Scott and Shackleton because they hadn't changed because there were no polar orbiting satellites, no GPS or sat nav or sat phone or anything else like that. So we went through a changing series of problems. And in many cases, they got less as we moved into the 90s and the polar orbiting stuff got over the poles as well. For, I mean, for me, I, I kind of think I've, I've been really lucky to sort of travel to a lot of places through the filmmaking. I can't claim any sort of thing that Rana's done, nothing like that. It's always been safely sort of cocooned in filming and all that. Um, so I don't really have that same thing. I think it's always got to be the, the person or the character or the lens through which you see that landscape. So it, it will always be, for me, I think it's always going to be the person more than the actual place, if you know what I mean. That's, it's always going to be it so it's hard to say really but um i do like i, I am drawn strangely i think to the to the sort of cold the arctic stuff i find that a really interesting compelling landscape for its bleakness but also for its beauty so i do i do like it although i always get sort of i always start to complain as soon as i get there <laughs> <laughs> yeah. british way <laughs> anyway well thank you so much guys for speaking to me today and best of luck with the release of the film i can't wait to go and see it again <laughs> when it comes out on the big screen this time Thanks. Oh, yes, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, is that yeah. from the Goonies? It is indeed. Yeah. Nice.